Hello, hobby friends. Last time, I worked on fixing up some old Assault Squad models, one of which is about 90% polymer clay. But these models are unfinished, because they're not painted. Let's paint them. Since these minis have magnetized bases, they're stuck to an old steel curtain rod. I'm using a can of black Rust-Oleum primer. Around half the minis have magnetized pistols, so they are getting primed separately on alligator clips. Alligator clips are great for magnetized parts as well as Gundam parts. After waiting two days for the enamel primer to cure, it's time to get them onto painting handles. Last time I used these handles, I used double-sided foam tape. It works alright, but it's not for me. Maybe I'll try a different brand in the future. Also, this one took a bite out of my wallet. I've heard of wallet gouging, but this is ridiculous. Yeah, I might need to get a new wallet. I remove the foam tape and apply my favorite handle adhesive, masking tape. There we go, time to get painting. The first step is to jam some black paint into the crevices that the primer missed. I'd rather do this cleanup step than risk gunking up the details with copious amounts of spray paint. This is especially annoying on the magnetized bits. Onto the first non-primer color, gunmetal. Since this is the first coat, I'm just slapping it everywhere. Then I overbrush Silver Vallejo with a makeup brush. This is my preferred way of painting silver. While I'm applying metallics, I mix a little bit of copper into a gold paint and apply it to the left pauldron of my Captain with Jump Pack. In my custom chapter, gold is reserved for captains only. I also hit up the iron halo on the banner pole as well as the one on the shoulder shield. Now I start adding blue. The metallic step was pretty fast. The trade-off for that speed is that the blue steps are painfully slow. Especially the base coating step. Though, I mostly only need one coat thanks to the bright silver undercoat. The blue base coating is done. I'm at my local game store's weekly painting night, and I'm ready to start highlighting. To make my highlight color, I mix my blue base color with white half and half. Applying it is a tedious, yet cathartic process of base coating the lighter sections and then glazing towards those same sections. I also edge highlight with the same paint. I'm not super concerned with the thickness. Thicker edge highlights can be seen from further away, which is how they will be viewed on the tabletop. Back at home, and these models look pretty good highlighted, but they can be pushed further. I take my light blue paint, which is a 50-50 mix, and add another helping of white. This lighter blue paint is about 75% white paint. I apply this in the same manner, putting down base coats and glazing transitions, making sure to cover less area than before. Here are some marines with one and two rounds of highlights. The last step of the blue is to add some shadows. For this, I glaze some black craft paint towards the top of the sides of these areas. I usually save this shading step for more important models, such as this captain. It also helps to hide the less than stellar sculpt of the clay jump pack. After fixing the edge highlight up top, I draw some panel lines with the same matte black paint. Since this guy is leaning forwards, the jump pack is one of the most, if not the most, prominent features of this character model, so I want it to look especially nice. Wow, that was a lot of intense highlighting, and I'm not even done. I've got four more. I'm gonna take a break and eat some chicken. So I'm laying down the brown, and I notice that the captain has a weird thing on his butt. Now, I'm no dermatologist, but I'll try my best. Come here, captain. I promise it won't hurt. Now that the growth has been removed, I cover up his exposed tushy with some more black craft paint. Then I continue base coating brown. I made a little oopsie on the thigh, but that's nothing more black paint can't fix. On this beaky sergeant, I remove the arms for easier access to the pouch sash. Not all my minis have removable arms, but I'm sure as heck gonna take advantage of the few that do. After the leather base coat, I build up a mid-tone with light brown craft paint. Then, I make some scratchy highlights to give a weathered appearance. Same for the backpack straps. I glaze the mid-tone, and this time, I use the mid-tone as an edge highlight on the darker section. Saving the brighter highlights for the brighter area. I also work up to the highlights on each diamond of the hammer handle. Finishing it off by recess shading with what I think is brown and black paint mixed together and thinned to a wash consistency. I don't really remember doing this step to be honest, 
but I typically don't use store-bought washes, so this is likely thinned on my wet palette. Anyway, here's how the leather turned out. It's not perfect, but I'm really happy with the result. Time to work on the chain swords. Just gotta get the paint out of my tongueless pot onto my palette. There we go. I usually start with the darkest color and work my way up in value, but I thought it'd be fun to try starting with the mid-tone. In addition to the chain swords, I also paint all the pistols red. That way, I remember they can be used in close combat. Yeah, I'm that bad at miniature strategy games. I glaze multiple coats of craft black. Unlike using a glaze medium, paint thin to a glaze using water dries way faster than that of normal paint consistency, which allows me to go back in for a second coat right after the first one. I didn't really even have to wait for it to dry. I don't know if quick dry medium exists, but if it does, I'd be willing to try it out. Then I edge highlight with a pinkish color, and finish it off with a glaze of pink up top and another glaze of red to bring the pink back down and tie the gradient together. This looks pretty good for one of the rank and file. For the second approach, I start with a 50-50 mix of red miniature paint and black craft paint. After two coats, I glaze some red. It looks pretty splotchy, but just like the black, I can almost immediately come back in with a second coat. And I do a third coat because the first two, being glazes, weren't opaque enough. Here they are side by side. They're pretty similar, with the bottom one being a bit brighter and more saturated due to the silver undercoat. However, the gradient of the second approach up top looks smoother to me, so I'm going ahead with that one. The pistols get the same treatment. Oh goody gumdrops, I get to paint all these pistols too. It's not like they're extra difficult to paint because they keep moving around or anything. I have all the red parts base coated in dark red. The problem is that I've mixed too much dark red. So I decided to move on to the skin tones and use the dark red as a shadow color. I gather the five unhelmeted marines and separate them into three categories. Light skin on the left, medium in the middle, and dark on the right. This is so I can keep track of them. It would be easy for the shadow of one to look like the midtone of another. I start by applying the shadow colors. For the medium skin tone, I use the dark red straight up. For the others, I lighten or darken accordingly. On the darkest skin tone, I use black to darken the shadows and brown to build volumes. It looks good, but I'm not completely satisfied with it. I can always go back and tweak it, but for now, I'm moving on to the other dark tone. On the captain, I build volumes in much the same way. I think this guy turned out a lot better, though I'm not sure why. Perhaps I just need more practice with darker skin tones. The medium skin tone is painted with the same process, but with slightly lighter mixtures of paint. He reminds me of a Star Wars clone trooper, but a little angrier. For the lighter skin tone, I start with a base coat that makes him look like Vision from the Marvel Universe. With each additional round of highlights, I mix in more and more tan until he's no longer pink. As a final touch, I glaze some red over the scar on the forehead. Here's how the other Caucasian guy turned out. These three baldies are done. Now unless these two are silver foxes with chrome hair, I've got some hair to paint. The captain's getting black hair with a stippling of two shades of gray. I'm not digging the stippling in the middle of the hair, so I tone it down with a black glaze. I decide to make the other dude a blondie and mix some yellow paint into my light brown for a desaturated base coat. Then I stipple a highlight. With that, the skin tones are finished. And here are the paints I used, minus the yellow. As long as you're comfortable mixing your paints, there's no real need to have a whole bunch of skin tone colors. After that slight interruption, I finish all the red. And my wet palette has dried in a weird way. Yeah, I always use DIY wet palettes, but this is the first time one has curled on me. I wonder if it's because I used brown paper towel instead of printer paper. Anyway, it's time for a new palette. I'm just going to reuse the spongy paper towel by flipping it over. After watering it, I put down a sheet of regular old paper and let the water soak in. A sheet of parchment paper and my new wet palette is good to go. There are only two chain swords left, the eviscerators. To start off, they receive a black base coat. I want to be able to tell these apart from the normal chain swords at a glance, so I'm thinking hazard stripes. Before I go any further, I remove the eviscerators and mount them on alligator clips. Next, the hard part. Laying out these stripes requires careful attention to their thickness, the intervals between them, and their angles. 
If an interval is too thin or wide, I might have to correct the positioning of a whole bunch of stripes. Once I have all the intervals done, I work on adjusting the stripes' thicknesses. Then I apply more coats. Upon completion, I trace the pattern over the back end of the sword. From that point on, it's pretty easy to translate the angled stripes across the other side. I look at the sword dead on to check that the ends of the stripes along the front side line up. After that, I do the same to the other eviscerator. I get out an orange craft paint and start the highlighting process. However, I actually like this brighter orange as the darkest yellow, so I switch to base coating. Here's the new orange base coat compared to the old one. I mix yellow into the orange and start layering up towards pure yellow. The nice thing about craft paint is that the translucency makes it a good layer paint. That's my opinion, I won't apologize for it. I finish off the eviscerators with an ivory tannish miniature paint as an edge highlight, along with gray for the black sections. This next part is not fun, at least not for me. It's just painting little studs, right? Well, to paint them, they have to be base coated black on the top, bottom, left side, right side, and front, all the while being careful not to get the black paint on the surrounding surface. For me, this is a true test of patience. Just as I think I'm done, I turn the model over to reveal all the multiple sections I have missed. And when I am done, I get to do it all over again with gunmetal. This is basically a base coating nightmare. At least when I get to the silver, I can avoid the rims and quickly cover the middles of each stud. And the result is worth it. They have that high contrast look metallics are known for. Speaking of metallics, let's put silver in the jump pack jets. These jump packs aren't for decoration. Their high power thrusters carry their melee focused persons into battle. So they should look like they're actually turned on, right? After two coats of white over silver, I apply some yellow. I put red over that, but it looks too much like condiments, so I dial it back with some orange. By the way, I have a little problem with this red craft paint. It's not the red craft paint I usually use, and it's about a decade old, so there's a little bit of skin that's formed on the top. Okay, maybe more than a little. Man, this almost looks like taffy or something. And the skin seems to have formed on the inside of the bottle too. I swear officer, this isn't what it looks like. Let's make a tool to get this out. Oh, oh my, uh, that, that is certainly something. Uh, what was I doing? Oh yeah, jump backs. I continued the process of yellow and oranges, finishing it off by reestablishing the white in the center. It's not the best looking thruster effect, but I think it's cool. I'm almost done. Just a few more details to go. How about some checker freehanding on the captain? I start with an off-white that I often confuse with my silver paint because they look so similar. I fence off the border of the checkered section with a line, then fill it in. This shoulder looks like it could also use some checkers as well. Next, I apply a darker but still light gray onto the lower facing areas. Up top, I create a highlight of pure white. Now for the lines. I'm not sure whether to use thin black paint or a marker, so I test them on my hand like a normal person. The Micron felt tip pen looks more consistent. Let's use it. I draw a center line, then a perpendicular median that runs the length of the white section. This is quite tricky. Depending on whether I'm drawing towards myself or away, the curvature of the surface seemingly falls away or pushes into the tip of the pen. I swear, I'm normally good at drawing straight lines. Once the cylindrical smiles were complete, I got out the red and then ditched it for my preferred red. I started filling the squares. Then I got smart and put a few dots to denote which ones were red to prevent my idiot brain from confusing them. On the shoulder shield, I challenged myself to do line work with a brush. You know, it probably would have been easier if I used one that came to a point. I fill in the red and edge highlight with white so I can layer the translucent red over it. This red edge highlight hack isn't as bright as I thought it would be, but it was worth a try. Next on the detailed chopping block are the glow effects. These areas have been left silver, so the white undercoat goes on nice and bright with a single pass. Then I carefully apply bright colors to the eyes. Space Marines are individuals. Just like how Jedi in Star Wars have different colored lightsabers, I imagine that each Marine has its own preference for their helmet's eye lens color. For the pistols, I use a saturated blue with a slightly different hue from the blue armor. I also use this to base coat the power sword. I try dry brushing a blue glow effect around the plasma coils, but it doesn't really work, 
so I glaze it instead. With that in place, I work up through manual highlighting until I get to pure white. Back to the power sword, I place black lines to act as delimiters for the future gradients. Upon putting the white ones in place, I glaze towards them with more white. The black lines also get glazes as well. Then I glaze blue to marry the gradients and make them more uniform. Once the gradients are done, I trace the edges with white. However, something about the gradients does not look quite right to me. So I shrink the white sections and add an additional blue glaze. To finish it off, I remove the arm so I can get to the edges on the back of the blade. The last detail, the leaves. They are painted with various shades of green, just like everything else. There aren't very many bits with leaves on them in Space Marine kits typically, so I like to give them to the squad leaders and captains and such. The last thing to paint are the bases. This couldn't be more simple. One coat of a light brown craft paint, and a moderate helping of khaki dry brushing. Okay, somehow I got white paint on this guy. I mix up some shades of blue, put them on, and it's all good. Oh crap, I forgot to highlight the purity seal paper. There we go, all done. Two coats of dark brown on the base rim, and these minis are ready to depart their painting handles. Here they are. These have to be some of the best marines I've ever painted. I love how the clean, smooth armor contrasts with the dusty, rocky bases. Normally, I'd dry brush a dust color onto the feet and ankles to tie the minis into their environment. But since these guys are flying around a lot, their boots are likely cleaner than most. The hazard stripes on the eviscerators keep catching my eyes. I think it was worth the time it took to paint them, though there might be a more efficient method out there. The red and white checkers on the captain's jump pack is another detail I find myself staring at. In addition to the leafy aquilas on the jump pack, it's a fast way to differentiate him from the squad he's joined. The dangling legs and the negative spaces underneath them really sell the dynamic essence of the hovering capabilities these Astartes possess. Unfortunately, only half my Space Marine army is painted and modeled to this standard, probably because it takes so long to paint them. Alternating between silver and blue everywhere is much more time consuming than just slapping the whole thing with a single color. Also, I keep fixing secondhand models, which adds a significant chunk of time as well. I have other armies whose builds are in progress, and they will have much faster color schemes. But while sometimes I wish my marines were easier to paint, I am glad to have one army that is painted to a high standard. One last thing. I actually heard that Assault Squad was removed or sent to Legends or whatever by Games Workshop right after I'd completed the build for these guys. But GW has new Primaris Jump Pack Marines. So if I ever play 40k proper, I'll just proxy these as the Primaris ones. And the good news is that I don't have to buy a $38 Captain with Jump Pack. Because I already have one, and it's made of clay. But instead of 40k, I'll probably just use them on one page rules, which still has an Assault Squad equivalent profile. I just checked, and everything but the combat shield is legal. Good thing I magnetized it. By the way, here are the magnetized bits. I should find a better way to store these than in a Gatorade bottle cap, but it is cute how they formed little pistol shurikens. Now if only I had some catapults. I'll see you next time for more painting and modeling. Until then, have a good one.